Welcome to Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever's On the Wing Podcast. Buckle up and ride shotgun as we cover everything you need to know about the uplands. The habitat. The hunting. And of course, your favorite bird dogs. Welcome to the last la- last place Major League Baseball team intervention podcast. <laughs> Representing the Detroit Tigers here, we got the Cincinnati Reds, Oakland A's, and Washington Senators. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever's On the Wing podcast. For only the second time ever, uh, we're recording on video. So that tells you how important this topic is to us. Um, it, it, the topic that we're going to talk about today is Recovering America's Wildlife Act. It's a, a piece of legislation that's been in the works for over five years. And as we, we talked about doing a podcast on this particular topic, we thought, you know, let's, let's keep it at high level and illustrate what this means to our members out there on the landscape. Uh, people probably have heard the, um, the acronym RAWA, which is one of the worst acronyms in the history of all <laughs> conservation. Totally right? agree. Totally agree. But uh, a lot of folks have heard of the acronym RAWA, but Recovering America's Wildlife Act, what this is intending to do, is not super well understood. So the purpose that we're driving for today is to sort of pull back the curtains and let the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever audience uh, have a better understanding of when this legislation happens, what that'll mean on the landscape. So when we do ask our members, the 140,000 Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever members, the 400,000 social media followers and the people that follow us on email, when we do have a call to action that says, contact your senator, right. contact your U.S. representative, they know, I know why that's important. And that's, that's the goal today is to break down Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So before we dive into that, we're going to go around the horn um, and, and have everybody give a little bit of introduction, uh, who they are, what they do. Uh, we'll start on the end. Um, he, you've heard his voice on the podcast before, but maybe you haven't seen his face, uh, Andy Edwards. All right. Thanks, Bob. So Andy Edwards, I'm the program manager for Quail Forever, and I've been with the organization since 2003. I live in, in Tennessee and kind of work from there, basically being a cheerleader for Quail. I'm, I've definitely not got the build for it, but we're trying anyway. So the cheerleader for Quail and work every day to just tell the story of the great things that are going on on the ground of the fastest growing conservation organization out there. So really a fun job. I've I've been in that role about a year and previously served the organization as a regional rep covering quite a few states from Indiana all the way down to Florida and um, just just love the organization, love everything we do and glad to be here. And one theme that will recur throughout the conversation today when you think about Recovering America's Wildlife Act, it's a piece of legislation that's going to benefit all sorts of species, but at the center of the bullseye mm. are quail, yep. right? And that's, that's something that's universal with all of our guests here today is to talk about how this particular piece of legislation, whether it's in middle, middle America or the southeast part of the country, uh, how it's going to benefit quail, the Great Plains, where Haley's from, or the West, where Al's from. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> we'll jump jump to Haley. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Haley. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm Haley Lockard. I'm the Senior Working Lands for Wildlife Farm Bill Biologist in Missouri. Um, it's a mouthful, but basically my job is to work with landowners, meet them at their property, hear their stories of you know, oh, my granddad used to hunt so many coveys of quail every day, like that tree, you know, that's where we had the last covey rise. So mm-hmm. work with them to try to find a way to get that tradition back, get those quail back on the ground, whether that's 
habitat improvement, restorations, or management. Um, so that's basically my role. Um, I'm in West Central Missouri right now. I've had a couple different roles with the organization since I joined in 2017. Um, was down in Oklahoma for a little bit and then Northeast Missouri, and I'm finally uh, getting back home where my roots originally started, uh, West Central Missouri. Mm. And when you... Um when you started for us, like you mentioned, in Oklahoma, you were in charge of a brand new program in Oklahoma, correct? Yeah, so I worked um, with the OLAP, um, Oklahoma Land Access Program. It's been a while since I rolled that one off the tongue, but yeah, it was their brand new walk-in access program, mm -hmm. much like Weehaw in Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, kind of worked with them to get that off the ground, but also include a habitat improvement component where the chapters contributed some money to get those landowners to make some improvements to make it better habitat for hunting for the, the public to come enjoy. So I was honored to be on the, the ground floor for that right initiative. Right on. So you'll be uh, speaking to Recovering America's Wildlife Act from kind of the Great Plains perspective, Missouri, Oklahoma, and then we'll move west hey. to... Uh, to my llama buddy. That's right. Uh, That's right. <laughs> How do you feel about me calling you my llama buddy? Uh, I'm okay with that. I mean, <laughs> it's better than what most people call me. Yeah. So. <laughs> so frequent listeners of the podcast remember Al, uh, Al and Wade Zarlingo, who worked with the uh, Arizona or works with yeah. the Arizona Game and Fish um, Department. There set up the backcountry llama quail camping merns hunt experience and adventure it was it was phenomenal i can't thank you enough for <laughs> tremendous memories and uh we do have a video in the works yeah. that we'll release um from that trip hopefully i'm not on it it's all about you <laughs> and everybody else you're on it uh <laughs> but that'll come out um uh, later on this fall. Cool. Uh, but tell us about um, ab about what you do for a living and, and sure, kind of your background. Sure. So um, I'm, I'm a West Region uh, director, so I get to oversee all the cool states in the United States, all the <laughs> ones with <laughs> elevation. And, and uh, with that elevation comes pretty neat experiences like we were just kind of mm -hmm. hitting at. But it also comes with the opportunity to talk about six different species of quail. Yeah. And uh, also... Mostly of what my job is in the western United States. When you think of the west and going hunting, what do you, what do you guys think of? You know, typically. Elk, Big game, deer. sure. So my job is to m persuade people that our six quail are at least as cool, if not cooler, than chasing elk and deer. So that's mm -hmm. my whole job is working with partners to try to highlight and, uh, you know, get more quail, f more focus, more energy on quail. Right on. So um, we're going to transition to talk deeper take a deeper dive into recovering america's wildlife act so you know by the numbers what this legislation would do is it, it create an influx of 1.4 billion with a b, with a b. Mm -hmm. i don't i don't even know what the austin powers look is for billion <laughs> 1.4 billion um that would help augment the states doing habitat work for species that they identify. So as, as, you, as I studied up for this podcast, you know, there's a tremendous amount of information about what Recovering America's Wildlife Act could be, right? Mm -hmm. right. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it, when you look across the country, there's 12,000, that's a five-digit number, 12,000 wow. species that are what they term as um, sort of getting ready to go into the emergency room for it threatened or endangered species, right? Mm -hmm. And if those species, those 12,000 species end up hitting the endangered species list, then states have to spend an enormous amount of money to recover the habitat to protect those those species and everything right. from monarch butterflies to bumblebees to lesser prairie chickens mm -hmm. to our beloved bob white quail are in this category of 12,000 species and y you look at every state has has these species that are the victim of loss of habitat and they don't have state agencies, pick your state, right? Missouri Department of Conservation, Minnesota DNR, Georgia DNR. They don't have enough money to address all of these. Right. So the, the idea of RAWA, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, is to create an influx of dollars 
right, mm-hmm. into right. these states <clears throat> to help address these species of concern. Right. So w- when, when you look at it, you know, the name is one of the – so the acronym <laughs> sucks, right? <laughs> but the suck. name – is actually speaks to what it, it does. what it is about mm-hmm. really well, doesn't right. it? Ed? It does. I mean, it it absolutely cuts right to the chase on it. I think the the acronym kind of muddies it for sure. But part of it too, Bob, is that it's it's been around a while. We've been talking about recovering America's Wildlife Act for quite a while, and I think so. It suffered from a little bit of lulls here and there. And is it happening or what is it really? And I've kind of forgotten. And yeah. so even on our end, you know, we have to kind of get brushed back up on all those things that Rawa could do. And it it takes that control back to the states based on their state wildlife act another acronym their mm-hmm. swap their state wildlife action plans and they go from there and help those and i'm going to throw another i'm a biologist at heart i got to do <laughs> another acronym rbis oh, yep. well, whip? Right. Whip? Yeah, yeah, yeah come on so species species of greatest conservation need okay scgn so that would be where <laughs> Know, Why do you do even acronym? Out, Why did you let him on? I don't this? know. <laughs> just can't help it. Anyway, help it. Species of greatest. That's, that's that's one for all the bios out there. Okay. So species of greatest conservation need. Okay. Um, and that's where those twelve thousand come from. So, okay. but those should all be in each state's wildlife action plan that they've developed over the last several years. They're typically a five year plan that puts into place. You know, here's the what if scenario. Mm-hmm. If what if what if the the money came through. Here's yep. where we would work. Um, the know. nice play, the nice part about those plans is they're often habitat specific, right? Grasslands, riparian, right. something like that. And so, you know, when I think of Re- Rawa recovering America's uh, Wildlife Act, it's really about money coming into the conservation machine. That's what it's mm-hmm. about, and it's going to the states to be able to do what they think is right, and that gives us a chance pheasants and quail forever to have that influence on those states and how they use it. So, if you jump on the Google machine. And you type in Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and you look for the beginning of it, you'll find National Wildlife Federation had uh, a sign-on letter. And if you've ever looked at a sign-on letter that goes to (laughs) policy in in Washington, D.C., or tries to generate policy in D.C., they're normally one, two, three pages long, Mm -hmm. right? And you can find this letter from 2017 on National Wildlife Federation's website. It's 31 freaking pages in wow. name. I mean, it'd be, it'd be shorter for me to tell you the, the entities that are, didn't sign right. on. But it, uh, it, you pick a species uh, that anybody hunts or fishes or a state agency, their name's on there. You know, obviously, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, Rough Grouse Society, Mule Deer Foundation, Trout Unlimited, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Delta Waterfall, Wild Steelhead Coalition, Dallas Safari Club, right. Michigan DNR, Minnesota DNR. You, you probably all expected those, sure. right? University of Minnesota, Meat Eater, Madison, Wisconsin's Dash Hound Club, right? right. Uh, Taos Mesa Brewing, Kansas State University, Rep Your I mean, 31 pages of support, which was Sort of mind-boggling for right. me. The yeah. only entity that didn't sign on was Nickelback. I mean, <laughs> I, they're not – well, Maybe the Inter- are, International yeah. Olympic Committee wasn't on there too. But, other, I mean, it was amazing how many entities signed on in support because there's so many folks that see the need for increase of funding at the state level. So mm-hmm. that's where I want to transition a bit to next. And we'll start, start with Haley about – when you think about an influx of money into a state, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, in your home state of Missouri, what paint a picture of what this would mean for bobwhite quail in Missouri, what, what, what it means to you um, and what it should mean to the Quail Forever audience. Uh, it, it means that, you know, in, in my home county where I did most of my growing up, we could actually see some quail. I think this influx of, of money that would be coming into the states would actually mean more quail. Um, you know, I think about my grandfather's property that, you know, I grew up, that's, it was my 100-acre wood as a kid. Mm-hmm. Like, we, I did all of my exploring, splashing in the creek, running around. I mean, I thought it was perfect habitat. I went to school and was like, oh, no, this is not great. <laughs> so, I mean, we threw the kitchen sink at it. Anything you can do for quail, planting natives, planting shrubs thinning out the timber we did it and 
you know, after 30 years of not having a single quail on that property, we were out checking fire lines one mm. day and flushed a covey of quail. Mm. Wow. So like the so first cool. covey I saw in, you know, my lifetime on that property, you know, came from doing some habitat work. And that was just a little bit um, of it. If we can do that everywhere, um, the impact would just be remarkable. We talk about quail and fire synonymously all the time. You even mm. mentioned, you know, fire break or fire line. Um, fire costs money. It does. And the, this influx of money, you know, I think in Missouri, a oh, huge opportunity would be having teams, habitat strike teams mm. that go out, <coughs> put fire on the ground, put habitat on the ground, help landowners with the restoration, make sure it's you know done properly um, mm. is a huge benefit that Recovering America's Wildlife Act would have to our state in Missouri. Um, I can't imagine the acres um, and habitat we could create if in all of our, you know, quail focus areas, mm-hmm. if we had a team whose their job was to go go create habitat, go add disturbance to the system and create more bare ground, create more, you know, wildflowers, um, whether it's, you know, fire is, you know, s- as you said, synonymous with quail. It's right. th- the best tool we have right. and it costs money, but... Rawa would put that money into the system and let us do that. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about how, how many how many species are called the firebird, I, right? Because I can <laughs> yeah. think of at least two, yep. right? Sharp tails are called the firebird, and so are quail. And w- am I missing any Contrary others? Contrary to the company Pontiac, the automobile manufacturer, that's not <laughs> that's not a quail on the hood. <laughs> I'm Smokey and the Bandit, but it should have been. Uh, <laughs> What about out east? When you head out east, what uh, what does well, Rawa mean? And I think Haley hit on it. You know, they're they're so disturbance oriented. And then the east, where we and I'm talking, you know, this is gonna kind of not uh, ring too true for the folks in Texas West, but we are getting a lot of rain <laughs> in the last two or three years. Yeah. And so areas that should be open and um, let's say a sparse understory for quail for quail chicks primarily to get around in with some overhead cover. They get too thick very quickly. Mm. Uh, two, three years, four. It's it's usually going the other way for quail in four years, uh, and so fire disturbance through, you know, e- even just tilling the land and keeping those, you know, the bare ground component. But most often, as as managers, there, you know, we're going to recommend fire in the system, particularly the our coastal plains, our pine coastal plains. Um, but even also, you know, throughout the central hardwoods, throughout the northeast, all the all the areas where quail might might be um, present on the landscape, we want disturbance. And to do that, it's going to take um, it's going to take people, boots yeah. on the ground. Um, we've done an awesome job in the last two and a half years with putting people out on the landscape. We're we're actually can, we're here at our national staff meeting, and for the last day, we've been um, meeting. 208 of our new employees that have not attended a staff meeting right uh it's an amazing thing and and those are 208 new people since in the last two years or so that that have come on to work for pheasants forever and quail forever and they're all out making awesome recommendations meeting landowners and producers out on the landscape and what we're seeing is we're kind of filling that cup we've Mm. got a whole lot of great recommendations out there Uh, lots of quality management plans now we need people to implement. Uh, we have a deficit of, of of implementers. And so, gosh, to be able to put a fire crew in South Carolina that says, you know, South Carolina, just to, to use uh, the, the work they're doing, for example, great, great momentum towards the management of, of wild quail on public land and on mm-hmm. private land. And we've added three biologists there recently. We got plans to add more, but we just um, we're talking weekly with them about a, a, what we would call a habitat team. A group of people that go out and either do burns or they do um, thinning for timber stands or they do native seed establishment or they do invasive removal. They do all these things to get more light, more more open ground down at the quail level at a few inches. It, you know, we, every quail episode we talk about, whether it's prescribed burning or thinning, <clears throat> it's it always comes back to more intensive management to help quail than particularly uh, you know for sure the pheasant audience understands the need to manage mid-contract management crp but it's 
just underscored, bold face, highlighted when yeah. it comes to quail. It's like if you're not doing something to the habitat, whether it's burning, thinning, uh, every two years, yep. you know. And you mentioned it with your your grandfather's property. Like, you know, well, what happened? Right, things moved on. It progressed. Yep. Right, the thing trees grew up, yep. grass grew up. Um, what is it? Like a gum. Oh, sweet gum. Sweet oh, gum. Gosh, it's it the just devil. chokes everything so in terrible. the southeast. Yeah. Right? If you don't have fire, if That's you right. don't have chainsaws, which both take money, you don't have quail. That's right. Right? Yeah. It, you will have, you know, perpetually. I remember the days of the trade shows or the fairs there. You stand and you, you talk to multiple people, well-meaning. They miss quail. They, they used to have quail on their land. And they say, well, why don't we have any quail anymore? The land looks just like it did. 30 years ago and I'm like really what did you do to keep it looking the same as it did 40 years ago right because you know and literally th those changes are small uh they happen so small it's just like in you know, our kids growing we don't see it unless we leave that landscape for a few years and go back and it is drastically different well you have to actively manage it to keep it looking the same and we don't realize that on that micro scale we're talking six inches and below I mean we're managing that's where we're at right on so as we transition from the southeast, let's go to all the way out to the west yeah. and think about Recovering America's Wildlife Act and what that means in a desert southwest all the way up to the sure. Pacific Northwest. Well, what Rawa means to me is it's go time, right? Mm -hmm. So a little bit of background on me is I, was, I worked for two different state agencies, and for a long time I got to ask, I want to do some more habitat work. I want to do some more habitat work. The answer was, we don't have money. We don't have mm -hmm. money because we're counting these, cr these species you talked about. Now, there's no excuse, right? Rawa means we got the money. Let's right. go do what we've already been saying for 10 years we should be doing, and we know what we should be doing. We can go do it. So an example for me, and it's pretty close to home, right, is in Arizona. Um, we've been working on a scale quail habitat initiative for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And by working on it, We've been doing a little project here, a little project there, but we have mm. about 25,000 acres identified, ready to go, that would really boost and kickstart our scale. 25,000 acres. And that's wow. just, just in Arizona. And that's not talking about, you know, the epicenter of scale quail, which is New Mexico. And I can get into that later too, but if we, all we need is money right now. And so we are ready to go. So what Rawa right. means to me is it's, it's, it's go time, right? It's kickstart time. And that's, that's just one species, one quail, one opportunity. Mm. So w when we, talk bobwhite quail you know it, it's thinning and burning mm -hmm. what's a habitat project K look like trees. for scale it's, it's killing trees you know we, yep. you talked about management you sure. know and it's just a scale perspective right we're a little drier so our timelines are different mm -hmm. but we have we've been suppressing fire forever and ever and ever which has led to more trees growing out into these grasslands and hmm. kind of getting thicker in places that they shouldn't be so all we're talking about is killing trees killing right. mesquite primarily for for scale quail but even with some of our other quail it's the same it's the same stuff our merns quail you know our canopy's too thick hmm. we got to go on the forest we got we got about a 20,000 acre project waiting there just waiting for money we got the forest service ready to go and hmm. all it's going to do is is, is uh, scale back those oaks that we walked through right mm -hmm. get that canopy covered down to where it's supposed to be instead of the 50 60% get it back down to 30 percent. okay more quail i lived that because i hunted the first day in 50 to 60 percent tree cover <laughs> I, I didn't think it was a tree it was 15 feet tall uh -huh. but it was a tree it's, a, a, quail. Tree. it's a tree for us and man. the Come second on. day we saw no quail the mm. second day yeah we we found merns and it was open grassland i was amazed at, at that yeah it's yeah. just so it's just it's back to management right and sure. putting resources towards it so that's what's cool about it i mean you know some of the other things we're trying to do and we're ready to do is in Oregon and Washington, they've been talking about relocating, transplanting, whatever mm -hmm. the right word is, putting mountain quail in places that they used to be. Wow. Habitat, actually, in this case, we got it ready. There's some riparian corridors that are ready for birds. Hmm. Now we're going to have money to actually go capture them and, you know, move them and all that stuff. Hmm. So those are the kinds of things that go along with, in the West anyways, is kind of we get to move critters around, we get to do different things like that. But it all comes back to the habitat, right? It, it comes back to managing stuff that hasn't been managed for a while. So we spent a lot of time, rightfully so, focused on the quail species because, it, you know, when, when we talk about Recovering America's Wildlife Act, 12,000 species that are potential here, and f for us, mm -hmm. quail are at the top of that list, right? Sure. But 12,000 species, there's got to be just a myriad of them, right, Andy, that, that people also care about like, give give some examples of like, if you do a prescribed burn in the southeast what else oh, is going to yeah. benefit absolutely bob i mean i think 
one buzzword that we we talk about or habitat type that we often refer to in the southeast that's that's definitely down is early successional habitat mm-hmm. so that's shrub you know early grasslands young grasslands with maybe a whole lot of what most folks would call weeds but wildflowers or or pollinator type plants then they in a few years they'll start some woody stuff coming in so there'll be um some species there but it's 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 rough ground it's it's if you walked away from a plowed field what happens in the first five years and so those species associated with that type of habitat are the most um you know the most i want to don't want to say endangered they're mm. not endangered most <laughs> most threatened most in species in greatest conservation need i should have come <laughs> back to my acronym <laughs> Dang it. but those are species quite honestly like like a Eastern meadowlark that mm. used to be everywhere, and everybody says, "Oh yeah, meadowlarks are all everywhere." Well, they're not in as near as many places as they used to be, but those are also species. And we we aren't touching on these, but they're salamanders, they're snakes, mm. they're they're aquatic mussels, they're plants. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, you know, Rawa could in, involve plant species as well. And so, if you're thinking that might, if there's something you used to see all the time and you don't see it now, it's on the list. You mm-hmm. know, so that's one thing I think is really interesting about this is, of course, we're partnering. You got 31 pages of partners right. at the national level, but I would say to to chapter volunteers and to local pheasants forever, quail forever members, this is your perfect time. Just like we do with youth hunts with other organizations and our chapters, this is the time to partner with those local you know, species, uh, you know, uh, affiliated groups or, or just, you know, wildlife groups, hiking groups, outdoor groups that love, you know, beautiful things and, and more creatures and critters. This is the time to get involved with them and make sure, like, reach across and say, hey, do you know this is coming up? We're, you can be the authority as a quail forever or pheasants forever uh, on the wings you know, follower. <laughs> say, hey, this is, this is really awesome. Yeah, it, it's something that's been around a while, but it's happening. There's great stuff. There's movement. It's coming, mm-hmm. and we need to be in support of it. So that's, that's something that's kind of re-energized me is, you know, I think about our t- – just had my banquet a week and a half ago. <laughs> our volunteers are not quail hunters. But they're, you know, they're people who love wildflowers. They're people who love, you know, clean water. They're people who love, you know, beautiful places. That's our volunteers sometimes. And so talk to those people. Get them involved. Hmm. Uh, Haley, when you think about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and some of the states that are important to you, we, we talked about Bob Boy quail. What other species pop up for you, into your mind? Yeah, well, uh, the lesser prairie chicken comes to mind from my work in Oklahoma. Um you know, out there, it was my first experience, like, living out on the big, you know, native prairies that mm-hmm. are not fescue and brome that I grew up with. Um, but there's a silent invader there. That's cedar trees. They're mm. overtaking <laughs> our grasslands, like, sucking the, biolog- the biologic diversity from, you know, the ground, sucking water out of the ground, quite mm. literally. And, you know, <laughs> to a lesser prairie chicken, they don't like vertical obstructions you know i think about you know i'd much rather be out on the prairie in the wide open but you plot me in the middle of downtown kansas city there's too many you know tall buildings around that's (laughs) the equivalent (laughs) of a cedar tree to a lesser prairie chicken Mm -hmm. um so trying to remove you know those obstructions opening up the landscape is all things we can do with money from recovering america's wildlife act so cedar trees are something that like so I grew up in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, right? And cedars, like, that's where you found the big swamp box, honestly, <laughs> right? But we're talking about different cedars, right? Like yes. When, uh, when, when I started working with Pheasants Forever, let's see, that was 2003. One of the first things I got to do, you remember when we had mentor hunts? I do. Right? Yeah. We, uh, new employees would went, go out with uh, more veteran employees. And I went to Nebraska, for, and I hunted quail for the first time. And... We see these eastern red cedars, right? Like, well, we don't want to go anywhere near there. And a kid from the UP is like, birds and woods, mm-hmm. right? Birds and woods. No, 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 Bob. Biological desert. I'm like, really? And you start to understand like, these these cedars are just so r- rampant yeah. in that they take over. And exactly. I, we, I sat through a, um, I don't know, a Zoom teams meeting with USDA about how how much cedar trees have taken over, particularly in the Great Plains, mm-hmm. 
it's freaking staggering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When, when you look at satellite images mm-hmm. of these cedar trees, and then they grow, the, like the stem density, that's a grouse hunter in me, right? <laughs> like the stem density, you try to find places where you can weave your way through, and yeah. that's where you yeah. find rough grouse and um, woodcock. But the stem density of cedars, like they're a barrier, like you're in prison, you can right. You yep. cannot get through, and, and so that's one thing. Like animals can't move through them at all, right? They're they're worse than a desert. I mean, they are a biological desert. But then, right? You touched on this. They suck all the moisture, right? They need so much water that like they're basically draining the aquifer, right? Yep. So it, it, when when it comes to particularly the Great Plains, like. For people that maybe hear cedars, they're like, well, what's a what's the big deal, right? It's yep. it's just it's a tree. Yep. It's not like nope. these are these are some of the most I, I don't know how to phrase it like horrific um, biological um, inhibitors towards diversity mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. wildlife, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yes, very much so, and they're really easy to kill. We just have to go after them. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? And so, yeah. wha- like, I, I, obviously a chainsaw would work. Yeah, but if you cut it, a cedar tree off below that first limb, it's dead. It's it dead. won't re-sprout. You know, unlike our, some of our other hardwoods, like oaks and maples, they'll they'll re-sprout and huh. create deer food. But you chop a cedar down below that, you know, first branch, and it's it's dead. It's mm. gone. Um, you instantly open things up and new and new growth can come in under it that it works for our species. And I'm he- I'm hesitating here because I think about cedars in in the east and and they're big. Mm-hmm. But what what we're talking about often is that scale in the in the prairies. When we say you know it could be something the size of this table and it could have 300 cedar seedlings in it, but they're this tall. Mm-hmm. They're they're actually shorter at times at first than those the grass that's there. So you don't notice the problem. Right. A lot of times until it's established, they're there, and then they shoot up, and they get big enough where you can't you just burn them, or you can't you can't easily mow them and, and get the rid of them. And the stories, uh, you know, at, um, when you're going through elementary biology class or whatever, the stories of well, there's no um, bison on the the Great Plains anymore to maintain the grasslands. There's no lightning and fire, so it, visually it's easy to sort of understand that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, but what's not as comprehensible, particularly for a person that didn't grow up there, is the the cedar tree sort of encroachment. Like uh, plant life just keeps on going, right? Unless you knock it back and create, as you the term you mentioned earlier, early successional habitat. There's just a, so many species mm-hmm. that need early successional habitat, whether that's fire, whether that's bison yeah. or cattle on the landscape Hoofprints, something yep. to maintain a grassland as a intact ecosystem if that doesn't happen in some form of management like trees just keep growing mm-hmm. and yep. when it comes to some parts of the country trees grow and that creates habitat for turkeys and deer versus others right but when it comes to eastern red cedars like the thing people are going to remember out of this podcast is Rawa is a bad acronym, and Eastern Red, red Cedars are the devil of <laughs> plant life, right? Yep. There, and, and, and that's something that in the Great Plains we battle for all sorts of species, pheasants, quail, yep. and as you mentioned, the whole thing I went off on this was about lesser prairie chickens, <laughs> right? Yep. <laughs> Yep. All right, what do you have to say about Eastern Red Cedars, yeah. Al? I, just, I, I hate them, too. But, you know, we, we got, got, uh, got, we got, got the things called trigger juniper. word for Bob. Yeah. Red Cedar. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> well, it's no different in the sagebrush world, right, in sage grouse world. It's 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 junipers instead of red cedars. Sure. Basically, it's another oh. cedar tree, right? And they're invading in. And, you know, over the what, past decade, we've impacted about 9 million acres of sagebrush habitat. Hmm. And that is basically one year, you know, we st- – we've balanced out one year of encroachment from juniper from that so we're behind right and we're making that kind of effort and that and that's the kind of impacts we're having and it's not just juniper i, I mean I exaggerate a little bit there so we're talking about annual invasives too. we're talking about cheatgrass and other oh. things kind of coming mm-hmm. in but yeah we've done all this work and basically we're only maintaining where we're at mm. you know and that's that's uh that's the excitement about rawa right now right. we're going to have an yeah. influx of what's coming in 
Um, and that's across the sagebrush ecosystem community, right? There's these huge threats coming in, and and we, along with a lot of other partners, are working really hard to address those. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I lost track of what I was going to say. <laughs> you got me going <laughs> on cedar trees. Yeah. Like, oh, I, I, was like, I can't wait to talk about <laughs> junipers. But they're not as easy to kill. You know, Some of them you can <laughs> oh. kill, um, <laughs> and, and some of them they will restrain. Sometimes re-strong. we okay. have chemical and all this stuff, but you know, you, you know, Haley, you were talking about the visual barriers, right? And you wanted to talk about balancing different wildlife. Well, you know, pronghorn specifically if we're going to go in and kill mesquites for those scale quail that i was talking about we can't just lop them off we got to knock that down so it's less than 20 inches 20 inches otherwise the pronghorn still will still avoid those Mm. areas sorry i'm getting dry here hang on a Mm. second (laughs) so if we really want to do the multi-species thing that's really core to what everything i want to do in the west right Mm. we have so many huge tracts of land so many cool charismatic critters um mule deer right all everything we do for sage grouse helps mule deer everything you know, um, a lot of the things we're doing for these migratory corridors, big game corridors you hear about, that's a huge, huge impact or uh, emphasis in the West. Really cool stuff, right? Because we still have these intact habitats that go from Canada, and we're watching pronghorn and deer come all the way down to Utah and mm. back, and because they can, right? Mm. Well, you know, and so, but with juniper coming in, there's that visual barrier. Suddenly they're stopping when we're, we're losing that flow of uh, genetics, but we're also just losing, losing the, you know, the critters moving around. And so that's what's exciting about it is it creates all those iconic, iconic Western, you know, visions, right? Mm-hmm. God, you're going to go out and you're going to go see a big elk or you're going to go see a deer or you're going to see a pronghorn. Oh, we're going to see sage grouse, you know. Mm-hmm. We're going to see, you know, whatever, you know, what, depending on what, what habitat we're in. And that, that's what's really cool. And I guess one of the species we haven't really talked about, and I, you know, Andy, you hit on this a little bit, but some of the exciting part is is, is humans, people, right? Mm. So when I'm when I'm coming from the West and we're talking about, you talked about water and say and, and cedars and this, you know, more water going in. We need water in the West, right? So everything we do is helping sure. me in Phoenix, right? You know, I, I we need water, right? And so all of our water comes from forests. All of our water comes from these the sage grass or sage brush, the the grasslands that all infiltrates in, comes mm. down, and goes into reservoirs. That's how. It works in the West, and so if we're not if we're not addressing this management, we're losing water, which means we're putting ourselves in a bad spot. Well, and you mentioned water, and I, uh, what I was trying to find is um, this also benefits fish. Oh yeah, right. Which uh, you know we we've talked a lot about quail and land species, but I was listening to a podcast with um, um, backcountry hunters and anglers mm-hmm. with. Um, Hal Herring did a podcast with Martin Heinrich, Mm -hmm. who is uh, one of the Senate authors of Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And they were talking about um, a trout species in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And help me with the the name of this. Are you the Gila? Gila Gila trout. trout. Yeah. Which, here's another example of a species that will benefit from an influx of dollars into a state Mm -hmm. to create... I'm assuming there's a quail connection there, right? Create, <laughs> Anytime create there's quail habitat. There's a wildlife connection. Right? Yeah, yep. And then it helps improve the water quality for the Gila trout, right. too. Water Cast and blast, Cast, baby. That's right. Recovering that's America's right. wildlife act. Well, you know, yeah. I plug my own state, right? So Gila, Gila trout are endangered. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and so are, oh, my gosh, I'm going to forget. Apache trout. I got mm. it. I got it. And uh, Arizona is the only place in the country where you can fish for both of them mm. legally. Anyways, you can do it illegally if you want to <laughs> in other places. But, yeah, you can go. And so, but at all, all that, all the, the Gila trout, all that stuff comes from New Mexico. All comes from the Gila Mountains, right? Mm. The water, you know, mm-hmm. the water comes, or the ra- precipitation comes down, goes through those those chains. And, yeah, if we don't have water, we don't have fish. We don't have, you know, it's just, I mean, it's everything. When we talk about the 12,000 species. I mean, it really is. What what mm-hmm. we're talking about here is helping the land, which is going to help everything. So. All right. So as as we transition towards a close here, uh, for listeners, like the goal, as I mentioned right on the outset, was to explain Recovering America's Wildlife Act, RAWA. So when we do get to a point where we issue an action alert, and hopefully you, you recognize that Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever we're very judicious about when we issue an action alert, but there's one coming for Recovering America's Wildlife Act. At some point this summer, we are going to ask you to contact your two U.S. senators and your U.S. congressperson in, in support of passage of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So where it stands right now as we record this at the uh, middle of May, um, 
the bill, the legislation has passed through the committee of both the appropriate committee of both the Senate and the House. So now this bill, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, has to be reconciled from the two bodies of Congress and go to the full U.S. Cong congressional floor for a vote. When it gets to that point, we are going to call on every Pheasants Forever member, every Quail Forever member, Quail Forever member, every Facebook follower, Instagram, Twitter, Katie bar the doors. <laughs> because this is going to be great legislation for every state in the country. If you live in Maine, it's going to help Woodcock. If you live in Tennessee, it's going to help Quail. If you live in Oklahoma, it's going to help Lesser Prairie Chickens, right? Sage Absolutely. Grouse. Everywhere in the country, there's 12,000 species that this is going to benefit. So the purpose, again, is to explain why this is such a critical piece of legislation that's coming. And it's been coming for a long time. Let's be honest. It's been, it, it was created in 2017. It's that little engine that could, little engine that could. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and we're almost there. So when we ask you to take that call to action we really mean it we need your help so as we go to closing thoughts let's go around the horn recovering america's wildlife act and you started to touch on on, on this call to action with your chapter volunteers but but um what, what's your closing sure. thought here yeah and, and i think you touched on all the members we in our chapter people are really used to that they're used to hearing that call to action but the followers i mean that four hundred thousand followers it's not it takes Bob, you, you know probably way better than I do. From start to finish, how long would it take if you were seeing that a post on social media, you click the right button, you go, you could type something, I think two minutes. Mm. I think you could send a call to action to the appropriate person. We're not, we're talking two to five minutes of your time to get that word out to how important it is and then pass that on, share it and, and have other people know about and it. And to that point, like, I sat in a goose pit with Colin Peterson, who's now retired, and he said, I asked him very straight up, like how many, mm. how many um, emails or letters on a particular issue will get your attention? Just laying in a goose pit with him. And he's like, 10. Wow. 10. Wow. 10. 10. 10 to a U.S. congressperson on one issue will turn their head. 10. We have 140,000 members. Recovering America's Wildlife Act, when we unleash it, we need you to act. Haley. Yeah, I think uh, this seems like an opportunity that we have a great conservation tradition in this country. We've brought a lot of wildlife back from the wow. brink. And we have an opportunity right now to stop triaging and help 12,000 species. Mm. Not one or two, mm. but 12,000 with something as simple as putting more money into the system. As Al said, we know what we need to do. Mm -hmm. We just need the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is the next big key to making habitat happen. And for folks that are listening and they hear money and they turn off, let me just remind you, if species go to the point where they're listed – you can just exponentially increase the amount of money that needs. I mean, this is <laughs> preemptive, right? Yep. Right. That's, and you know, I've, I mentioned so many darn podcasts, the web of life that we all learned in third grade, or you guys probably learned in fifth, first grade. I was <laughs> in the UP. They teach things later. Um, <laughs> Were those the best three years of your life? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's all like, it's all connected, right? Yes. And we can we can do some good things with a particular species in mind. And the ripple effect, as we talked about, it it just keeps going. It's exponential, right? Yeah. Mm. Al, closing yeah. thoughts. It's hard, it's hard to follow Haley. She uh, she, she kind of killed she, it. She she did great. So I guess what I would I'll try to say something inspirational. Is this going to benefit llamas? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> No, you know, I've been I've been uh, in the conservation world for 25 years, and this is a special moment in time. Mm. We have an opportunity here to really make make a difference that will be remembered 100 years from now mm. yeah. for the the conservationists of the future. It's true. If we get this right, and that's why we need the help of our members. Like if we get this right, we're changing the next 100 years of conservation, mm. and I think that's pretty special, and it's pretty cool that we have that. That's a really strong point. It, 
another podcast I listened to in prep of this was the Artemis podcast. And Sarah Parker Polly mm-hmm. um, is the head of the Missouri Department of Conservation. Talk, it compared this um, Recovering America's Wildlife Act to Pittman Robertson. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Pierre. And it, there's a lot of parallels there where it is you know paying it forward mm-hmm. for future generations mm-hmm. and you know, that's it's really well said that's yeah really exciting yeah awesome. moment in time sometime this summer look for that action alert recovering america's wildlife act for quail for lesser prairie chickens for sage grouse for topeka shiners to <laughs> monarch butterflies the bumblebees and for you and me Thank you for listening and for watching yeah. this episode of On the Wing Podcast. For Andy Edwards, Haley Lockhart, and Al Iden, I'm Bob St. Pierre reminding you to always follow the dog. Something good will rise. <laughs>